Hello, Sarah. Hi, Doctor. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Hi, Dr. Sarah Mustafa from Dentist Channel Online. Welcome to today's webinar about MIH, a diagnostic dilemma and its minimally invasive treatment protocol. While we are waiting for the participants to join the session, I will introduce you to our company. Dentist Channel Online is a digital dental media company. It is your marketing solution for dental events, product launches, workshops, and courses. We also provide a collection of scientific articles and blogs about different topics in dentistry. We work hard to be your first-hand information on the technological advancements in the dental field. Now it's time to start the session. If you have any question about this topic, MIH, a diagnostic dilemma and its minimally invasive treatment protocols, feel free to ask it in the question and answer box and we will answer each and every question at the end of the session. I will start by introducing today's session speaker, Dr. Tahir Shaib. Dr. Tahir graduated as a dentist from Pakistan in 2012. He then pursued his passion by gaining his master's in clinical dental practice from Queen Mary University of London. Alongside, he was awarded the membership of the Faculty of General Dental Practitioners. He then went on to pursuing his clinical doctorate in pediatric dentistry from the Barts and Royal London Hospital in 2019. Welcome, Dr. Tahir. It's our pleasure to have you with us. Thanks so much, Sarah, for having me. <clears throat> so, hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Um, I hope you all can understand my, my accent. And if not, please feel free to drop any question here as well. Shall I start now? Sarah? Yes. Yes, please. Let me share the screen. Okay, the light. So, um, I'll be talking today about molar incisor and hypomerization, or as you like to call it, MIH. That's clear. So, I'd like to start the presentation with the slide. So, research has shown that by age nine years of age, um, Children affected with MIH have undergone dental treatment 10 times more than control. And this is for this reason that these children develop dental phobias much more than normal children or children who are not affected with this condition. So basically, they have all, all odds against them. So what is MIH? So MIH, by definition, is hypomineralization of systemic origin, presenting as Demarcated opacities and qualitative defect of enamel, uh, affecting one to four first permanent molars, and it can frequently associate with uh, affected incisors as well. This definition was given by Wareham back in 2010. So I try to summarize everything I know about the topic, although it's really difficult to squeeze everything in 45 minutes. But I try to I try to explain myself from the perspective of a general dentist but it's really aimed for everyone. So in certain cases of MIH, signs and symptoms are really mild, uh, and it can really go unnoticed and even undiagnosed. And there are certain cases uh, where we see that children have extreme pain and sensitivity, especially in their molars. Um, so you can also have poor self-esteem, since these, these children can have opacities on their incisors, and they often complain about being bullied at school as well. So the early diagnosis is really the key. As Mittel's work shows us that MIH affected molars are up to 50% time, they are affiliated with hypomineralized second primary molars as well. So diagnosis should be made as soon as it's clinically apparent, either in the primary or the permanent dentition. So it's really important to develop a good rapport with these children and their families as it requires a prolonged treatment. So moving on. So, okay. So there are different guidelines uh, to treat MIH. Uh, but the first thing that it's really important I'd like to establish is the difference between hypoorganization and hypoplasia. Uh, 
uh, although these conditions are quite different, but they can really occur simultaneously at times as well. And hence, uh, it can get difficult to diagnose. Enamel hypoplasia basically is a quantitative defect, reduced enamel thickness. So the enamel may be of normal quality, regular quality, but it's in very reduced thickness. So what we do know about this condition is it's due to disruption during the secretory stage of amelogenesis. I love this picture a lot. Uh, it's interesting to see, it's a very classic hyperplastic lesion. Um, it's interesting to see that the borders of these, lesions, of these hyperplastic lesions are perfectly smooth and regular, which indicates us a develop, developmental and pre eruptive lack of enamel. So the quality of the enamel isn't bad. It's just of reduced thickness. And this can result uh, in exposed dentine that can become stained and hence confuse us with hypomerization. So it's important to have rounded margins, really. Um, in contrast, an MOH lesion, uh, they are more irregular and sharp, which, is, which are indicating towards post after enamel breakdown and shearing of the weakened uh, enamel. Okay. This, again, is a very classic picture of chronological hypoplasia. Uh, these molars have been removed from the same child. You can see a very distinct defect here uh, on the molars. It's basically a timeline defect, and both molars have been affected here in a very similar manner. So this is a very typical example of linear hypoplasia that affects all the teeth that were developing during that time of the amelogenesis. If we see the incisors of the same child, they again show a very close appearance uh, of chronological hypoplasia on the incisors as well as on the lateral incisors and canines. So we can tell that this child was probably suffering from some sort of illness during the first few years of life, probably closer to the birth. However, we can also sometimes see enamel hypoplasia in individual teeth. Uh, this normally occurs when there is an infection or trauma to the primary precursor. Um, so this is a very important distinction between the two types of hypoplasias. Okay. So the other conditions and primarily the essential condition that we're going to talk about today is hypomerization. Hypomerization, as the term explains, is defined as deficit of the mineral content of enamel. So enamel may be of normal thickness, but it's very poorly mineralized. And it's because of this reason that these teeth tend to chip off, and even they are very prone to caries. It's basically a defect that occurs during the maturation stage of amelogenesis. So when we analyze uh, extracted teeth affected with hypomerization under an electron microscope, although this qualitative defect is not always, always seemingly seen uh, aesthetically on the whole tooth. But on the microscope, we can see that there are phosphate and calcium loss throughout the body of the lesion. Hence, in such patients, we really need to replenish what's lost. And this can be a challenge for us clinicians. Okay. So, what are the other conditions that we need, we need to differentiate the image from? Let's talk about fluorosis. So fluorosis, particularly myofluorosis, can mimic as MIH to us. Uh, and it has diffuse opacities affecting all the teeth. What's however different in MIH is that we see well demarked opacities that are limited to molars and the incisors. Also, in fluorosis, the teeth are very caries resistant due to higher fluoride content. However, in MIH, they are more prone to caries. Also, what we find in fluorosis is these children have a very strong history of fluoride ingestion. Either they might have, they might have had well water uh, during the initial stages of their life or any history of ingestion of toothpaste. So this is quite distinct between the two conditions. 
So another condition in which we need to differentiate MIH from is white spot lesions. We all have seen these in our everyday practices. And how can we tell if, the white, if it's white spot lesions or hypomerization? Well, it can sometimes also be both, to be honest. Uh, the best way, however, to distinguish a white spot lesion from MIH is that if these various lesions, they normally occur uh, in plaque stagnation areas, particularly the cervical margins and the proximal margins. MIH, however, you normally see MIH lesions on the incisal two-third uh, and not on the cervical margins. So one another differential diagnosis is with AI, as you like to call it, amelogenesis imperfecta. With AI, however, unlike MIH, all the teeth are affected, and there is often a very strong positive family history. So it's very genetic. However, there are cases where there is spontaneous mutation as well, but mostly there's a strong family history. Also, it's sometimes possible to detect AI pre reductively on a radiograph, as these teeth are associated with troidondism. In contrast, MOH cannot be diagnosed pre unless the teeth are erupted and you can see it clinically. Okay. So let's talk about the anatopathology of MIH. This is a very distinct feature in MIH. Uh, histopathological data reveals that unlike other types of enamel defects, the hypomineralization in MIH it basically starts at the ADJ and not at the surface of the enamel. And hence, in mild cases, the defect remains limited to the inner enamel while the outer enamel remains intact. And only in severe cases we see that the entire, entire thickness of the enamel is affected. This is also one of the reasons why treatment protocols like resin infiltrant icons, um, they don't seem to work very successfully in mild MIH cases, because the defect is lying beneath the superficial two-third of the healthy enamel. Okay, so I'd like to quote uh, one of the study. Uh, this was done by two of my professors in Queen Mary, namely Prof Fern and Prof Anderson. Uh, it's a 3D edge microscopic study, and what it shows is that an MIH affected tooth is up to 20% less mineralized, and it can have three to 15 folds higher protein. Low mineral content really explains why these teeth are more prone to caries. Uh, hence, it creates really a challenge for us clinicians to replenish the mineral that was in there in the first place. Also, the high protein content in these teeth is the result for poor bonding of the resin composites. So it's really a challenge to restore such teeth unless we for materials like sensory crowns or full coverage coronal restorations. The bonding with composites has been seen to be quite poor. So moving on to the etiology. This is the question I get asked most by the parents. Doctor, why did my child has this? To be honest, we don't have any distinct evidence that points towards one or two main causative factors. I don't know the answer. However, what we do know is that in most, it's most commonly seen in children who, who had illness during the first few years of their life, especially close to birth. Having said that, we still see a number of cases who have MIH uh, who had no distinct medical history, and they still lead to this condition. So the etiology is really confusing. What normally I ask my patients, my parents, the parents that come, is that if they had any complications during the third trimester, or if the child was sick during the first few years of life, or if they had chicken pox during the first few years of life. But to be honest, we still don't have anyone, anyone answer regarding the etiology. These are all hypotheses published in the literature. So prevalence is quite variable. Worldwide, prevalence ranges from three to up to 40%. These numbers 
reasons, there's a reason why there's such a marked variability uh, depending on where the data was collected and how the data was collected. Since there isn't any standardized tool to record much, hence such a mark, mark variability. So prevalence, this prevalence data that I have put here is from the D3 group. It's an Australian website uh, that, had, that has loads of information on MIH. I really suggest you all to go and check this page. It's, it's really helpful, not just for the parents, but also for the clinicians, for people who are involved in research, and it's very well up to date. So the highest prevalence ever recorded was 40%. And this was the this was Bomber's work. However, the reason for such high prevalence is that he was practicing in a specialized based practice where all the patients were referred. Uh, and hence it does not explain the whole prevalence. So there are different tools to measure and record MIH. However, since there isn't any one standardized tool worldwide, this explains the marked variability in the prevalence as well. And out of all the classification out there, my personal favorite is the one given by the first group in 2017. It's a very subjective classification uh, based on the patient's signs and symptoms. So talking about the clinical implications, MIH has on an individual. The prime reason these children visit me is because of caries and sensitivity. MIH have significantly less mineral content, quoted as up to 60% in some studies. This makes them very susceptible to post after breakdown, caries, and sensitivity. And although these children experience marked sensitivity, which is again linked to the enamel, being porous. And what you find is, it's really difficult to achieve effective anesthesia in these children, since the pulp becomes hyperinflamed due to chronic stresses over them. And for a shorter treatment of MIHD, it is important for us to achieve an adequate local anesthesia. And as I explained in my earlier slides, these teeth have abnormal etching and bonding pattern. That's because of the high protein content in them. So what we find is that the success of our resin composite bonding is remarkably reduced. Behavior management in these children is also a challenge. And as you know from Yalvik Fox, that in nine years, these children can have up to 10 times more treatment than control. And this really impact on the behavior of these children. Okay, so let's talk about the financial concerns which again, it's more relevant for clinicians who are working in private practice. So it's again, a very important dynamic that we cannot overlook. All right, so normally for myself, I like to divide my management into really three main phases. For these children, my main focus always is enhanced prevention. And this really is what sets a pediatric specialist apart from other dentists really good with prevention. Uh, so once prevention has been established, I like to treat my patients with minimally invasive protocols rather than, than being an interventionist. And then of course, a good maintenance plan is very important, especially for such patients. So in terms of our enhanced prevention protocol, I really like to focus on what I call the four pillars of prevention, which of course includes brushing, fluoride varnish applications, good diet, and lastly, fish assailants. I try and talk about each of these pillars one by one now. So amongst those four pillars of prevention, my number one priority being is brushing. I cannot stress enough on this. That's prime, really. For children up to 10 years of age, I like to prescribe them with an adult toothpaste. Uh, for children 10 plus, I, I, I tend to prescribe them with Colgate Turofat, 
that has 2,800 parts per million for right, and for children 16 plus who are affected with MIH, I prescribe them 5,000 parts per million for right toothpaste. My personal favorite has been ClinPro toothpaste, which also has the benefit of having PCP, that is tricalcium phosphate, which really helps to replenish the lost mineral. Also, all my patients who are at high risk of caries, including those affected with MIH, I tend to prescribe them CPP, ACP, which is the tooth mousse, or which, which is all commonly known as uh, Ricaldin as well. So CPP, ACP has the potential to remineralize uh, these lesions, uh, not just superficially, but throughout the entire depth of the enamel. All right, so this is my in-house protocol. One method I use to motivate children is by making, sorry, is making use of plaque disclosing tablets or even plaque disclosing gels that are now available. And it's at this time that helps them understand what the problem really is. It helps me clinically to assess and, you know, really it helps us to know about the surface of the enamel uh, because the risk is significant in these children for caries. It also helps us to assess the degree of porosity on the surface of the enamel. I don't know if many of you have used the plaque disclosing gel, but here it indicates us about the fresh plaque as purple and the light blue that you can see is more cariogenic plaque. So I feel that these plaque disclosing tablets, not only does it help us and parents teach the children proper dental techniques, it also helps the children visualize the importance of taking care of the teeth. And they also see both the areas they need to brush better and how they have been improving over time. Okay, so fluoride varnish, it's an integral part of my Riemann protocol. Um, I'd like to share a randomized control of relative effectiveness. This is Chestnut's work. What they find was in community healthcare program, by an application of fluoride was not significantly different from that obtained by applying and maintaining fish sealant for up to 36 months. So I really believe that fluoride, it's really very superior in terms of both preventing caries as well as cost effectiveness. Okay, let's talk about persistence. So the first thing I do when I see a molar with MIH, I tend to apply the Riemann protocol and that is sealing them. For mild MIH cases where the molars are only mildly affected without any signs of post doctor breakdown or where the child has sensitive molars, I tend to use glass ionoma. Since GIC can chemically bond to these teeth, uh, and it, it, it can even bond in moisture environment, uh, and, and even in the molars that are that are partially erupted, it does it does a great job. So for such patients, I tend to intervene at a very early stage now. Okay, so I want to discuss some of the factors that I consider myself. Uh, before I make the treatment planning for the child. So starting off with age, both the chronological age, the dental age, then the severity of the lesions. We know that the brown lesions are more prone to break down than the white lesions. Um, and even the behavior management, uh, it really impacts our decision-making. Uh, on what treatment to be carried out and what not to be carried out. Since we know that in children, the treatment is all the patient dependent and not the clinician dependent, right? So age can really impact the child's behavior management, really. Also, we need to assess the severity of the MIH. If the child has pain or sensitivity, it can really alter our treatment planning. And restorability is quite an important factor I need to discuss. Uh, we know that these teeth have low mineral, poor bone strength, and you can even see who has a failure in the enamel as well. 
that will really impact on the longevity of the restorations. Also with severely affected molars, it's sometimes difficult to assess where to finish the enamel margins. Uh, we also need to see if the third molars are present or not. And again, the treatment cost, as I discussed about earlier. Okay, so in terms of treatment options for the affected uh, molars, I like to start by using glass ionoma, especially in cases where the pain is uncontrollable due to severe pain and sensitivity. And when it is difficult to complete the restorative treatment uh, in the initial visits to the cooperation. Also what we've seen is GIC has sedative properties in cases of hypersensitivity. And it can really help by soothing the hypersensitive pulp and although this is a two-stage technique, uh, so once the cooperation gets better, I have controlled the sensitivity, I then go on for the final restoration. And even though this being a two-stage two -stage procedure, I offer my children, my, my patients, a more shorter and more comfortable uh, appointment to them. And obviously we have the option for full and partial coverage, uh, or the stenosis crowns or composites, and then where the prognosis is really deemed to be very poor, we can extract the teeth as well. So the restorative materials for the molars. So in terms of restoration of the affected molars, we have a number of materials to choose from. However, in most cases, I'd be using composites and stenosis crowns. There are strong evidence in favor of these materials uh, and their success rates in MIH cases. But especially in MIH cases, we may also be using a lot of glass ionomer to control the pain and sensitivity. So we know that bonding is an issue in MIH. Uh, as they can have up to 3 to 15 fold higher protein content, leading to cohesive failures in the enamel. So, the protocol I use for the teeth with enamel defect is I pre treat them with 35% sodium, with 35% phosphoric acid, uh, followed by sodium hypochloride. This really helps to eliminate any plug and biofilm uh, and improve my bond strength. Although a lot of this practice is proposed treatment, uh, there's less scientific evidence supporting the claim, but this is what I do for my patients. Okay, so when enforced extractions are to be considered for the poor prognosis molars, if it's a simple case uh, of extraction and no other orthodontic concerns, the rule of thumb is that the best time to extract the first permanent molars is when the second permanent molars are still within the bone and there's radiographic evidence for the formation of their refurcation. It tends to give us the best outcome in terms of spontaneous base closure. So this is a case study by Roswald. Um, we can see here that the panoramic view at age six Calculated and broken down molars. These were considered to be of poor prognosis. And then at age 10, in fact, they were extracted around age of nine. And then this radiograph is at age 10. And lastly, the last OPG that we have is at age 13. So we can see fairly acceptable results. We have achieved only by extraction therapy. So when considering extractions, uh, there really are certain factors that we need to consider. Uh, these include their dental age, their chronological age, and then how, how psychologically mature the child is. Um, but the number of molars affected also plays a big role. If only one or two molars are affected, I tend to be more conservative, and I tend to say that. However, if more than three molars are 
out of poor prognosis or deemed very in a poor state, then I, I like to go for enforced extraction. So basically, because the aim is that we want to achieve, uh, is we want to achieve a good quality of life for the child, right? We cannot do that by being over heroic and restoring three to four molars. Uh, this way we'll do more harm to the child than benefit, really. So speaking about the treatment options for the affected incisors, we really have a number of treatment, of treatment protocols. What we find in MIH affected incisors, these teeth can have white to creamy white to brown opacities. Uh, so the treatment really depends on the severity of the lesion. What we've seen is that brown and the white opacities, they respond better to microabrasion. However, in many cases, there are, there's, a, there's a hierarchy of treatment protocol uh, until satisfaction is achieved. So most of the options that I've listed here are quite minimally invasive. Um, and I miss some of but you know, the, the option I use most often is microabrasion. And I may sometimes complement my prohibition with bleaching to get more acceptable results. Another technique that has been published in the literature is called etch bleach seal technique. What they do here is they etch the, the lesion with either hydrochloric acid or phosphoric acid, followed by bleaching it with 5% sodium hypochlorite for five minutes, and then re etching it. And then finally, finally they seal it off with a clear sealant or composite. This technique has been uh, published by Wright. Also, resin infiltration, or as we know it as ICON. This is one of the most minimally invasive treatment that I've put it here. Um, and obviously, we have the option for composite veneering, uh, and finally, porcelain or Emax veneers or crowns, but only once the gingival margin has matured. So here's a case of a case of mine. Uh, so this is a lovely seven-year-old girl who came to me with complaint of sensitivity uh, in her lower molar, as well as uh, she had concern, aesthetic concerns as well. So again, for her, we started off with enhanced prevention, oral hygiene instruction, supplemented her with Clintro, TCB toothpaste, and recalcitrant, and along with temporizing. Uh, her low left E initially with Ionoma to control the sensitivity, which I literally store with stainless steel crowns. For other molars, we managed to uh, restore them with composites uh, before pre treating with them with 5% sodium hypochlorite. And then lastly, for her incisors, uh, as she had creamish obesity, I started off with microabrasion, followed by bleaching. And I think we managed to get fairly reasonable results here. So this is another case uh, where I did microabrasion, which was followed by icon infiltrant. Um, again, this child was seven and she was being bullied at school at this young age. So it really was a matter of concern for us to restore these teeth and improve our aesthetics. So what icon is, it's basically a novel microinvasive technique that makes use of a very low viscosity as an infiltrant, which is capable of penetrating these demineralized lesions. And how it works is it actually improves the, the refractive index of the lesion close to that of healthy enamel and hence improves the translucency of, of these teeth. So then we managed to get very acceptable results, I believe, without needing to drill and fill the tooth. Okay, so to finish this all off, uh, I'd say early diagnosis and enhanced prevention and the Riemann protocol. This really is the key, really. Uh, I've already talked about all this in great detail. And then three to four monthly follow-ups is the key. So, so that we can take any early intervention if required, along with educating the patients and the parents about this condition. I strongly recommend that all the parents and the practitioners, as, a, as well as those involved in research, 
do go and visit this page. It's called the D3 Group. It's an Australian website. Uh, it has whole wealth of information on MIH and not just in MIH and on other dental defects as well. Um, and it can really serve as a very good tool to educate both the parents and the children. Thank you so much for listening and hopefully we get to meet each other again. Thank you so much, Dr. Tahir, for this informative session. So meanwhile, yes. I ask your permission to introduce our company to all the participants. And I request all the participants to kindly put their questions in the question and answer box. And we will answer each and every question at the end of the session. So now I'll, I'll be sharing a small presentation about our company and our upcoming webinars. So this is our company, Dentist Channel Online, Healthy Smiles, Wealthy Lives. So Dentist Channel Online is India's first digital dental media company. We did webinars and courses with more than 400 national and international speakers, many world implant expos, and much more. If you're not a Prime member yet, kindly join our family to get free certificate of participation after every event and get exclusive offers and discounts on our online and on-site paid courses and workshops. And most importantly, from now on, Prime members will be awarded with one CPD CE point for each webinar. You can use my promo code SAR100 to benefit from a discount on the Prime, Prime membership. So it will cost you around $9 per year. This is an example of the certificate of participation that you will get. About our upcoming webinars, we have a webinar tomorrow with Dr. Enrico about his upcoming Congress in Sardinia, Italy, about focus on the gender shift in dentistry, a new perspective or a future challenge. And another session with Dr. Aisha about the basics of root coverage procedures in periodontology. On March 13, we have a session about uh, laser dentistry in daily dental practice, and another one about infection control in dental clinics. Another session about hair transplant surgery, and Dr. Noor will talk about medical emergencies in dentistry. On March 19, we have a session with Dr. Alessio from Italy about new instrumentation of root canal systems, and another one with Dr. Vishal about the eyes see what the mind knows, so understanding oral precancerous lesions. Dr. Ankush will talk about pain, let's crack the enigma. And Dr. Nikita will talk about post extraction bleeding. Dr. Juan will talk about uh, communication, communicate to win, how to bond with your dental patients. Dr. Salam will have a session about the basics of mastering ceramic veneers preparation. On March 27, we have two sessions, one about maxillary sinus lift and another one about oral hygiene in orthodontic patients. On March 30, we have a session with Dr. Monica about pathway and the road ahead of dentistry. About our upcoming master classes, we have one with Dr. Ankit about the art of interpreting the different shades of gray. I request all the participants to kindly save this number and then send a message on WhatsApp with their name so they will be added to our broadcast list and they will receive everything about our upcoming dental webinars and courses. Today's webinar is sponsored by Nova Mind. <clears throat> Nova Mind offers a full spectrum of, of implants and prosthetic solutions that accommodate any clinical need in modern implantology. We successfully supply highly demanded dental implants types called internal hex, tissue level, bone level, and active conical connection. Our EU production unit and product quality is appreciated worldwide. If you want to know more about Nova Mind, kindly check their website. And last but not least, don't forget to follow us on our social media platforms, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. Now it's time to move on to the question and answer session. So we have a question about, uh, in these patients, recommendation is to use high fluoride toothpaste PPM. 
It is like in general pediatric patients, it varies from 500 to 1000 ppm. Okay. Uh, so basically what the English and Scottish guideline, they say, and even the American guideline. <clears throat> so for children who, who don't have any concerns or who are at low risk of caries, we should be using at least 1000 ppm of a right toothpaste. But those who are at concern, who are at high risk of caries, or who have <clears throat> any unfavorable condition or any enamel defect, we have to use high fluoride toothpaste. So for children up to 10 years, uh, the recommended guidelines, they say that we, we should be using at least 1450 ppm of toothpaste. For 10 plus, it's 2800 ppm. And then for 16 plus, it's 5000 ppm. But it should be for a short time, short duration and under the supervision, supervision, of the, supervision of the dentist as well, obviously. Okay, doctor, we have another question uh, that is not really related to the topic. Uh, what cement should be used for looting crowns in pediatric patients? Okay, so for myself, I always use GIC, uh, type one GIC. It's also coming by the name of Mexicap, uh, but I know people who also use in phosphate cements. But I believe GIC, since it can really help, uh, there are some claims that it can help remineralize uh, tooth, as well as, uh, you know, it can really control the sensitivity. So especially in MIH patients, I like to use GIC. Okay, doctor, another question. Uh, in MIH patient, if we have to extract the, the tooth, we have to extract all the first molars, so it really depends. Uh, in general, if there are if there are no orthodontic concerns, and if all the four molars are deemed to be of poor prognosis, then yes, we I would recommend to extract all the four molars. But we should always liaise with the orthodontist, and it should be a multidisciplinary decision, uh, and not just of the pediatric dentist alone. But in there are cases when only the upper molars are affected, where the lowers are sound then we should always liaise with the orthodontist before taking any decision. Okay, doctor. Uh, so another question, what are the measures for MIH? So yeah, I did not get this question. Measures, measures in what terms? Like, are you talking about the class? Uh, I think she's uh, about dietary. What are the dietary measures for MIH? So again, is it a clear question, or the doctor has to ask again? Just like for any children, any child with high risk of caries, uh, we recommend a diet which is low in sugar, uh, low carb, <clears throat> free of sticky carbs. Uh, we always advise the patient to avoid fizzy drinks and acidic drinks. That's, that's mainly the main concern, the main focus. Okay, doctor, I think that's it. We don't have any other question. Uh, it was a very nice session, a uh, very informative one. Everything was uh, very clear and well presented. I would like to Thanks thank so you much. so much. Thank, thank you. It was a pleasure Sarah. having you with us. We are looking forward to organizing more webinars with you in the future, doctor. Thanks, Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a good night. Have a good night, everyone. And thank you for joining us tonight.